Hello everyone, welcome once again to my YouTube channel. My name is Bobola. Um, I'm with my green card story. On this channel, we talk about EB2, NIW, and everything that pertains to EB2, um, uh, NIW. Uh, one thing about my green card story is that we help people um, be, to draft their petition cover letter or to review those that they have um, to, to help those that have written that quality letter to review their letters. So if you want more details about the services that we render, please go to our website, www.mygreencastory.com. During today's interview uh, section, um, I'm going to be interviewing someone to be talking to us about O1 visa. The reason why I've decided to interview someone is because I've noticed that a lot of people, their petition has been approved, but they're kind of stopped because their adjustment of status is not, uh, their priority date is not current. And right now, the current priority date is still around, I think, February 2023. And there are people that their OPT is about to expire, or maybe their OPT has even expired, but they don't know what to do. So. Today's interview is about um, putting the information out there about an alternative um, work visa that you can get, pending the time you get your, your green card or your EAD card. Before I continue, I'd like to, to, to state clearly that my green card story is not a law firm and we do, we do not render uh, in, um, legal advice. Therefore, what we're about to share is just our opinion, our option, and, and based on our own personal experience. Thank you so much. So for today's meeting, um, I'm, I'm going to be interviewing a very special guest. His name is Mayo Kohn, and I, I will allow him to do a proper introduction of himself. Mayo Kohn, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bobola, for having me. And great job you guys are doing at uh, My Green Card Story. Like Bobola said, my name is Maya Kuhn. Um, I'm an architect and an environmental engineer. Um, reside in Texas. Uh, and also, um, you know, I one of the pathways that um, was available to me was the EB2 and IW. Um, which was what I did, and I've helped a couple of people achieve. So it kind of just opened up more pathway, uh, you know, opportunities for me to look at all the pathways because I realized that information is king in this in this game. So, um, you know, one of the other th ways that people do not know about usually is the O one visa, and you know, like Bubble, I said, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, um, yeah, excited to have that conversation. Okay, great. Th thank you so much, my account. So in order not to waste people's time and also in order not to waste my own time, we we'll just drive straight to the question. So first thing first, you know nowadays a lot of people have a lot of people are applying for EB2 at NW and the person has been approved. So for example, I know people that I've worked with and the person has been approved since February 2023 or even March 2023, but they cannot turn in their adjustment to status form or even apply for EED card because their power date is not current. And some of them, their OPT is about to expire, while for others, their OPT has never expired. So what can they do? What, what, what is O1 visa? How can applying for O1 visa or obtaining an O1 visa help them out in this present situation? Right, okay. Uh, so. The way an O-1 visa can help out in this situation is simple. And, you know, so straight straight up, first of all, what is an O-1 visa? Um, it's a classification. It's a visa classification that is reserved for uh, people with exceptional abilities in the arts, sciences, business, education, and also athletes. They, you know, this is a category of visa that can apply to these people who have demonstrated um, extraordinary ability and have sustained national or international acclaim in their field of endeavor and that want to continue 
in that field. So it's important that, you know, those um, three aspects are clearly enumerated and stated in your application uh, to prove that you, you actually hit that benchmark. So one is that you have to prove that, you know, you're someone of extra, extraordinary ability in your field. Um, that number two, you have sustained national or international acclaim. And that number three, you intend to continue to work in the field of that endeavor. Now, of course, as we go on, we'll get into, um, um, you know, what, what can qualify as extraordinary ability and stuff like that. But to the second part of the question, which is how can that help in the situation is simple, is the fact that um, the EB, the old visa, I'm sorry, is a visa category. Usually it's, it takes a shorter time um, to process. So if you're able to process that, and if fortunately you do get that approved, then you're able to continue to work in your area of specialization, um, you know, for the time. Because what you want to do, obviously, is you want to make sure that at all times you're maintaining a legal status. You want to make certain of that. So that can help you when approved to continue to maintain the legal status and work in your field, um, you know, while you either continue to wait for your uh, priority date for EB2 um, and stuff. Um, so let, let me ask the follow up question to that. First, thanks for the, the, um telling us all about Oma Visa. So what, what, uh, uh, what does it mean to have extraordinary ability? Or how, how can someone prove that he or she has extraordinary ability? That, that's the first question. Then, then number two, what are the specific requirements uh, for Oma Visa? For example, we, we know that for EB2 and IW, there are specific re re requirement that you need to meet. For eb one the that there's also, there's also a specific requirement that you, you need to meet. So right. in the case of O1 visa, what are those requirements that must be met? Okay. So um, in the case of O1 visa, like, like we said, um, yes. One, you have to show that you have um, extraordinary ability. Now, the way they measure that, just to that part of the question, the way they measure that is, I would say it's broad, right? So there are some that are, out of the bag, everybody knows that that person has extraordinary ability. And I'll give an example. Um, Lionel Messi, he came to the US on the O-1 visa. His visa was approved in one day, right? I mean, it's Lionel Messi. And so he meets, obviously, the acclaim of one is a uh, is someone of extraordinary ability. Hey, you can see what I'm, I'm wearing. So I would argue that he's the greatest of all time. But... So that, number one. Um, number two is the fact that, obviously, um, is, it was coming to the United States, um, you know, to continue in the area of endeavor because, you know, obviously, it still continues to play soccer and stuff. So there is that uh, that level of requirement where, you know, if you have a, a prize like the most prestigious prize in your field or in your profession, that qualifies. But... If you don't have it, on let's face it, not everybody has that. If you don't have it, there are opportunities to qualify on that lesser awards. So it's it's actually very similar in that in that sense to things like EB one and EB two in that it, it could it's international or national acclaim. So lesser awards in your field on and you know in your in your um, field of endeavor and in your profession that is maybe national and based off, off of um, like a national criteria will also pass. But there are other ways you can prove extraordinary ability. Um, if you are a member of a profession, for instance, that is um, that has like a, a an association or a body that regulates it, a professional body that regulates it. Now, your membership of those associations can also help you but even furthermore, you might be able to obtain what they call a letter of consultation. So, for instance, um, and I'll just throw this again out there. As I mean, you're a member of the Actors Guild, for instance, in a country, and you're trying to obtain this visa. Now, if the president of your guild writes a letter saying that you are um, a, 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 you know, someone of extraordinary ability in that field, that will be a very strong point that mm -hmm. you can use to prove, right? But it's not, it's not the, again, still not the only way to prove there's, there are just many others. So now 
then specifically getting into what are the requirements. Um, one, you should be able to um, show that you have, again, quite similar as a matter of fact to the to the EB visas. You should be able to, if you, if you have, so it has to be three of the eight, right? If you have um, publications, journals, um, um, you know, scholarly articles in your field that signify that you have made significant contributions to your field, that counts. Now, also, if you have um, publications, media publications about the work you have done, that also counts. So, so that's two different things because a lot of times people confuse that, right? You, that scholarly articles, journals, um, publications that you have written and posted. Also, if there has been um, articles and journal, I mean, yeah, articles and publications written about your work, stating how your work has been um, of quite some importance in the field, that also counts. Um, it also counts, one of the points is that if you have received remuneration higher than ordinarily, um, um, you know, received in your field, that also gives you a point. If you have held a position, a critical position of leadership or a critical role in an important organization, that also helps. Um, so you you have to only, like I said, you only have to meet three of this. And in addition to, let's say, a lesser known award or, or a claim or stuff, and you will be well on your way to, to being able to actually begin to marshal your points. Okay. Th thanks so much for that explanation. Based on, on what you've explained so far, right. I think the requirement for OMO visa is, looks similar or sounds similar to, to, to those of um, EB, if, if you want money. You but, know, it does sound similar. Um, but, but, I mean, but, 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 but majority of people that I know, they, they are... They are just eligible for EB2, NIW, and the standing chance of getting approval in that area. So very few people that have met, so very, very few, maybe like 5% or maybe 3% that can, that can actually get an approved petition for, for EB1A. So those, those um, so for those that they only qualify for EB2, NIW, how can they still meet that those requirements? The one, the one just mentioned for, for, for O1 visa. Yeah, so you know, for EB two and I, uh, for EB two, a lot of times too, you have to um, some of some of the parts that you may also have to uh, like kick would be that you have to have like um, if if you've held a critical role in a critical organization. Now that doesn't mean, for instance, you have to have been hypothetically speaking that that doesn't mean you have to have been the head of software engineering at. If you, you get what I'm trying to say, but you even, you know, you might actually be able to prove that if you were a lead research student in your university, in your graduate school, because that's a critical organization to research. Do you understand? So, you know, a lot of times when we say critical organizations and critical roles, yes, it's easy to prove it if you were a manager at a Fortune 500 or stuff like that. But you have to understand that a lot of times what these guys are trying to look for is the efficacy of the work you're doing and now it ultimately benefits the United States. And if you're able to, and I, and I know this because I, I, I speak from experience, if you're able, if you were a lead research student, for instance, in your grad school days, you had a research that, you know, was primarily under you and you were able to prove that. Then now you are, you're able to meet the aspect of I've held a critical role or leadership in a critical organization. Um, then, of course, if you have the same publications and, and journals or articles that you would use for the EB2, the same thing would qual also qualify you for, for the O1. Um, so you just really need to find one or two other ones with, you know, among the eight to hit it. Now, here's where I would say the challenge might be a little bit. And for people to learn, to understand, the EB2 NIW is actually a path to green card. The O-1 is a visa. So that's the big difference that people need to understand. And then being a visa, it means that it has a validity period, you know, and maybe we would have gotten into that. It has a validity period of three years from the date that the endeavor, you say you're coming to do that. So where, you know, just trying to point out the differences is the fact that, like I said, it's for people in, 
business, arts, education, sciences, athletics. Now, it has to be tied to some kind of job in that field. So, Unlike so, so, NIW. So, right. so, so is, is it compulsory for a potential applicant to have a job before they can file for home officer? Um, based on what you just said. It is not compulsory for them to have a job already lined up. Hmm. But in certain instances where you don't have that, it is necessary for you to be able to prove that your coming or your getting approved is the pathway to actually doing a certain job. Now, and I give you an example just to make it um, understandable. So at, for a certain client that we did this for, they were trying to come set up a branch of an existing business that they already had in the United States. So they registered their company in the United States, which you can do. You don't need to be in the United States to have a registered company, right? They registered their company in the United States with the um, articles that essentially state that this is what the company is going to come do. Then that company, being a United States company now, files a petition for this person to come over. It is in the arrival of this petitioner that it then begins to facilitate business with that company. So I explained that to say that you know, that company right now or whenever they set it up in the United States is essentially just a registered company, but it's not like one that is turning profit yet or something like that. So there was a business already or and you don't. OK, just to make sure that I also add it, you don't exactly have to have had the business running in another place, by the way. You know, if you wanted to set that up, if you had a business you wanted to do, then you could also set that up here. So. But the, the why that is important is you cannot self-petition on the old one. A U.S. company or a U.S. agent or a representative of a U.S. company has to be filing for you. So if you do, if you, there's a U.S. company, that means you already have the job or, or a contract. So sometimes it's not even a job. It can be a proposed contract to say, well, we want this person to come over here to come and help us do X, Y, Z things. And, you know, this is how we'll be remunerating the person. Um, there's going to have to be contracts and stuff like that. Those are part of things that you will submit. And then, boom, that's the document that you need. But so there has to be some kind of arrangement that okay. shows there will be some kind of job to be done when this person comes. Now, that's where the old visa is very remarkably different from okay, the so so, so can, can I ask a quick question? I mean, you, you have shed light on, on so many things um, based on the last question that I asked you. So you have given us examples of the supporting document that we, we can attach to right. the petition. Right. Well, can, you, can you tell us the exact form that a petitioner must fill during, during the application process? So for example, if, if you are filing for EB2 NIW, a petitioner will fill their G1145, their form I140, their ETA um, 90, 90, um, 89. So for home officer, what are the forms that a petitioner must fill? It's a, yeah, so that's actually simpler. You just fill the I129. Now, in filling the I129, however, and you would... If, if you affiliate the I want one twenty nine, how much is the application fee for the I one twenty nine? Right now, as we speak, it's still four sixty four hundred and sixty dollars. Now, while you're filling that, just to 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 um quickly fill that in, while you're filling that I one twenty nine, you would have stated whether you have um um dependents that are going to be coming with you. You know, if you're filing O two and all, so you would have stated that and submitted. Now, when your petition gets approved and then you need to apply for a visa, then you will be able to file applications for the people you have stated in your I-129 that will be part of your dependents. So just to, to ensure that I make that clarification. So when you're filling the I-129, it's just you because you can only fill one application per person. However, 
you they would ask you there if there are dependents and mm. depending on what you feel would affect um when it's approved and now you have to come fill for your visa okay so so i have another question absolutely so you know you know you you said that if if a person is filing for home visa the person cannot file by themselves they need a sponsor okay. so so, let, so so let's say there's there's someone that that has already has an approved EB2 NIW uh, petition, mm -hmm. and and um, the person is actually working. So let's say the person is working in, in the tech field, or or with any other co company. Is it possible for that person person to approach Israel a company and ask if they can file? A O one visa for Imo, huh? especially when um, the person's OPT is about to to to, to expire. Is, is that something viable? Because I, I know that most companies usually file for H one B for people. I know that H one B is, is based on the, on the lottery system, and the application system for H one B I think starts around March and closes in April, and you don't get a, a decision until is it September or October. So yeah. instead of the company filing H-1B for the person, can, can the person approach the company and ask if they can file the own one visa for him or her? You know, absolutely, it's possible. Um, but of course, the, whether or not that would happen would have to depend on the company and their policies and, and all the things that they have to um, go through because, you know, they would have to look at the the, on the balance, they would have to look at what they have to put forward um, you know, if what does this mean? If, does this mean now we have to create a different contract that is different from the pathway that, you know, we were going before with this person, whether they want to do that. But um, I would absolutely say that's a question you can definitely ask, depend, especially depend on the kind of relationship you have with your company. Sometimes maybe even depend on the size of the company. We know that sometimes it's easier to get things through with um smaller companies than with the mammoth giant establishments who have in a lot of times very rigid protocols to protect themselves understandably but um yes that's that's a question you might want to open up with your company if if you're in a field that works and you know that that because that that actually because the old visa you know the response is faster and all of that and you can get you some kind of eligibility um that that might be something that yeah you may okay. want to bring. Okay, that, that that's great. So the next question is, you know, for EB2, NIW, and also EB1A, you can file by yourself. Okay. You can get a company to sponsor you. And if, and if you are filing by yourself, you can actually use the service of, of a lawyer to file for you. So for Omo Visa, can you actually file by yourself or do you need to employ the service of a lawyer to, to, to file for you? Um really again up to you you don't have to the the um usis does not require that a lawyer has to be filing it the only require so when i say you cannot self-petition it does not even mean you cannot write your petition yourself or write your cover letter yourself or, or gather your documents or you know and make your argument yourself the only thing is unlike the niw where you can self-petition for the eb2 niw and which essentially means your 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 own sponsor for the O visa you cannot be your own sponsor so there has to be a sponsoring entity and again just to make it clear the language from USIS is a US employer a US agent or a representative that has been ap appointed by a foreign employer to be their agent in the US so that's where if you then have a U.S. company registered, that U.S. company can be your agent. Exactly. But um, so can you use a lawyer? Yes. Must you use a lawyer? No. Um, can you self-petition in the sense that in your cover letter, you're going to say, I am petitioning for myself? No. Your cover letter has to say a particular agent, which would usually be either a U.S. company or U.S. registered agent, is asking for your services to come over. Okay. Wow, right. that, that that's great. So much information. So the next question is, I, I, I'm going to paint a scenario for you. So let's say there's a young lady, she's on O1 visa, sorry, she, she's on um, um, OPT, and she has four months left on OPT, and mm -hmm. she, she's not 
entitled to OPT extension. Correct. Okay. And she, she wants to turn in a petition for EB2 NIW. But she knows that if even if uh, 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 EB2 NIW is, is approved by April, obviously she cannot turn in uh, adjustment of status because mm -hmm. our power date is not current. So is it possible? So, so let's say that, that the lady has like an uh um let's say a non-government um uh, not is it non-governmental organization or, or, or what they call it NGO? Is mm -hmm. it possible to file a petition for EB2 NIW and also file a petition for O1 visa? Uh, because if if both are filed together, then if both are approved. Our own officer will be active. She can use that to continue her work while she waits for our power date to be correct for her to turn in our uh, adjustment of status um, document. I'm just asking. Right. So what, 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 what I'm interested in, interested in is that, is it possible to do concurrent filing for both EB2 and IW and own officer? Okay, so first of all, like you stated when you started the program, we're not lawyers, so we're not offering legal advice. We're offering, you know, more of our knowledge. So um, anybody that is in that situation will definitely benefit from the advice of a lawyer. But here's the thing that I know. Um, in For most application types, does one application, um, you know, impede another? Are you able to turn in two different application times, at, at two different application types at the same time? In most cases, yes. So an NIW would not impede you being able to turn in an O visa. That's the straight answer to that. Now, in terms of how it would eventually work, I believe that's going to be on a case by case basis. But um, what you have to probably just keep in mind is the fact that when it gets approved, your O one again is a visa. So you will have to have a visa interview. You cannot have a visa interview on U.S. soil. So that's something to keep in mind in that you will have to probably step out. And also that's why I said it's in the, in that case is a bit of a tricky situation because you're already here. Just just given the fact that the O-1 visa in the real sense, in the way it's designed, it's really designed for people who are already who are outside the U.S. but trying to bring in their trade or business um or acts or something into the u.s so the baseline assumption is that it's, you're going to get a visa right it's also important to know that the visa is valid for a, a period of time which is three years and then it's renewable for an additional length of time of the visa so if you get three years you can renew for another one year making four you can renew for another one year wow. making four. you can renew for another okay. one year six but that's it so do, does the spouse of the pe pe petitioner also get an OMO visa or, or or do they get like a derivative of an OMO visa that don't allow them to work? You know, for example, That's I think spouse of H1B visa, H1B would get like another visa, but with that visa, they can't work, right? That's so correct. In case of OMO visa, how does it work? Same way. The spouse of an O1 visa, the spouse and kids get an O3 visa. With that, they can study but they cannot work. Wow, this is so interesting and very enlightening. I think you have answered all the questions that I have. And because I asked you a question and you answer like <laughs> the question <laughs> and two extra. So, oh, well, so okay, okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Great. So I think I've asked all my question, but is there any other thing that is um that, that I believe anyone that is interested in exploring the OMO visa option needs to know about the OMO visa or about the OMO visa process? Yeah, so um so any yeah, I, I think the only thing I will maybe just re armor on is anyone who's trying to get get that process um should understand that a lot of times the emphasis is on you being able to prove that what you are, you know, filing about is what you are trying to come to do in the United States. So you have to establish that now. And so it is important for you to have, even if possible, an itinerary 
So if you can say from, so let's say you're coming to, to, to do a business, for instance, right? You should be able to say something like from month, let's say you come in in June, between June and July, you're setting up a venue, you're, uh, a location, you're opening bank accounts, you're this, you're that. Between July and August, you are shopping for clients, you are doing this, you're doing that. By August to um, November, you're setting up your first seminar. You're doing this one. You do. You get what I'm trying. There has to be like they want to see a detailed, if possible, iterated, um, 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 you know, steps or or processes that you. Want. So that's that's what is important. That's again where it's a bit different from the general EB visa, where you're really more um focusing on espousing your abilities here. You're really detailing that I am coming to get a task done. I'm coming to get a job done. And there has to be clarity on that. So in as much as it's necessary that you meet those criteria, that helps them determine that, yeah, you're, you're somebody who's great enough to be able to come. Also have clarity in, in stating what you're coming to do. And if possible, having an itinerary for it. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayakon. Thank you so much for coming on this channel to shed light on on Wovisa. And to all our viewers, I'm so grateful that you, 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 you took out time out of your busy schedule to watch this. I hope this information will, will give you like um, access to the necessary, um, should I call it guidelines or, or, or basics about Wovisa. And um, please go online go and do your own research. If you're interested, speak to someone that have, that have gone through, through, through the process be, be before. And based on that, um, make your decision on whether to pursue over visa or not. And please don't forget to sus subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.